Greetings and welcome to Mr. Van Lowe's poorly monetized low budget science channel. Do not click like, do not subscribe. Okay, today we're going to take a look at topic 6.1, which involves circular motion. So our learning objectives, by the end of this lesson, you'll be able to identify the forces providing centripetal force, and those forces could include tension, friction, gravitational, electrical, or magnetic force. You'll be able to solve problems involving centripetal force, as well as acceleration, period frequency, angular displacement, linear speed, and angular velocity. You'll be able to qualitatively and quantitatively describe examples of circular motion, including cases of vertical and horizontal circular motion. We're gonna look at a horizontal example, but it would also apply to a vertical example, potentially. Okay, uh, so let's take a look at circular velocities first. We have an object on a circular path, and as you can see here, we uh, also can see its direction of velocity. Okay, velocity is tangent, which means if you draw a line here, that line will only be touching one line on our circle. And it also means that uh, velocity is going to be perpendicular to this radius line here. Okay, so if we draw a line from here to here, we've got our radius line, and we have perpendicularity. All right, uh, next, linear velocity of an object on a cir circular path will be given by this equation, where V is equal to two pi R divided by T. Okay, and just identifying our variables here, R is our path radius, and T is the amount of time required for one full revolution. And you probably recognize uh, the circumference of a circle in that equation as well. Okay, so we have a circumference a distance versus a time, and that, of course, is going to give a meter of distance per second. And that is what we would expect for the unit of velocity. Okay, uh, our linear velocity is the magnitude of our velocity vector, um, and its direction is going to be, again, tangential to the circle. Uh, we've covered that point twice now. Okay, so angular speed is given by omega, and that's going to be equal to a change in angle divided by a change in time, okay? So change in angle here uh, and our change in time, here we start at t equals zero and we go to our change in time delta t, this could be any value, okay? So uh, you could also refer to angular speed as angular velocity or angular frequency. Uh, you will hear them used interchangeably. And we're gonna see this in topic nine as well. Okay, so next we have angular speed, uh, and we should note that a full revolution is gonna result in a change of angle of two pi radians, and our change in time will be equal to T, uh, the period of one cycle or one oscillation. So what that means is our angular speed then is equal to our change in angle divided by our change in time, which is then equal to two pi, uh, or 360 degrees, divided by the time required for one full revolution. Um, note that generally here for angular speed, you want to use radians and not degrees, important point. Okay, so our angular speed omega then is given by two pi divided by t, and we know that frequency is equal to one divided by t, so we can put those guys together, and we'll find that our angular speed omega is equal to two pi times frequency. All right, next we're going to look at velocity and angular speed, and our velocity is going to be calculated using circumference and period, and there it is. Okay, uh, we can then relate velocity to angular speed just by uh, substituting 2 pi divided by t with our angular speed which is given by omega. So this is given in, this equation is given in the data booklet where velocity is equal to uh, angular speed times the radius of the circle. And as always, defining our variables, important. Okay, there they are. All right, uh, next we're going to look at acceleration because uh, there's something a little unintuitive here going on. So we're going to put it together. Uh, so, we know that acceleration is a change in velocity over time. The unintuitive thing is that the magnitude of our velocity is not going to change. But because its direction is changing constantly, 
that means we must have acceleration. Okay, um, so I just covered all these points, convenient. So a change in velocity here is gonna be given by uh, final velocity minus initial velocity. And you'll note that again, our speed's not changing, just our angle. So we need to use uh, vectors in order, in order to deal with this. So uh, if we use vector subtraction here, we've got our uh, tail to tail method of subtraction. And here's the direction of our resultant vector after some subtraction, okay? So um, we have here a change in angle, and in this case, that change in angle is gonna be equal to this value here. Okay, we know from topic two that acceleration is given by a change in velocity divided by a change in time. Okay, so we could use calculation, uh, calculus here, but we're going to use geometry instead, and it's, it's still linked to calculus, but uh, anyway. Uh, we're going to use what's called a small angle approximation in relation to the length of an arc. So uh, if we look at our vector subtraction here, what we're going to notice that, is that if we sweep this uh, our initial vector over to our final vector, it produces an arc. Note that this arc is not related to our circle, our circular path, because... Uh, our velocity vector is not gonna equal the radius of our circular path. So um, this is a different circle. Uh, we should note though that arc length is equal to a change in angle times a radius, okay? And the radius of the arc in the diagram is going to be equal to our velocity vector. So that means that our arc length will be given by a change in angle times our velocity vector or radius of this particular system. So what does our small angle approximation look like? Well, if we decrease this angle, um, our arc is going to get closer and closer to a straight, straight line. So in other words, our arc length is going to approach the magnitude of our change in velocity as our angle gets smaller. Okay, so you see the arc is a little bit flatter, angle decreased, and a little bit flat, flatter, angle decreased, and this is where we could link this to calculus because as our angle approaches zero, our arc length will uh, approach a straight line. Okay, so using a small angle approximation then, uh, our change in velocity is going to equal arc length, which will be equal to our change in angle times velocity. Okay, uh, so change in velocity is equal to the change in angle times the magnitude of the velocity. I just said that. Okay, moving on. All right, so here are the key points. Let's just summarize. Remember that our change in velocity over a change in time is going to give the direction of our acceleration. So our acceleration is going to be pointed in this direction. And you'll note that uh, as our angle gets smaller, this change in direction is going to be perpendicular to velocity, okay? So the direction of our acceleration should also be perpendicular to velocity, and that's exactly what we see. So our acceleration is always pointed to the center of a circle. And that's regardless of the position of the acceleration. Um, and I've already mentioned these points. Okay, so here we have acceleration being a change in velocity divided by a change in time. And we know that velocity times a change in angle uh, divided by time divided by our change in time is going to be equal to our change in velocity. Okay, so this is our linear velocity and this is our change in angle. Okay, so we can substitute then our change in angle divided by change in time with our angular frequency because we've already defined angular frequency as those values. So that means that acceleration is equal to velocity times our angular frequency. Uh, you should make sure that your angles are in radians. Again, do not use degrees for this process. Um, the reason for that is because radians are essentially unitless and degrees are not. Um, this is slightly rearranging our equation from earlier, but uh, we've just popped the R into the denominator under velocity. Um, and substitution here uh, is going to give acceleration is equal to velocity squared divided by radius. OK, 
Okay, so we've just put this into this position. Okay, uh, and this is in your data booklet. All right, so acceleration is equal to velocity squared divided by r. We've just established that. We also know that velocity is equal to two times pi times r divided by t. So we can do a little more substitution here. And what we'll find is that two pi r divided by t squared divided by r is equal to acceleration. And uh, using a little bit of factoring, we find out that our radius in the substitute uh, in the denominator cancels out, and we're just left with r. And we're left this, with this 2 pi divided by t squared. And we should recognize that uh, that is equal to angular frequency. So we can do one more bit of substitution. And we'll find that acceleration is equal to angular squared times radius. And this is in the data booklet. OK, next we have centripetal, uh, centripetal force. And centripetal force is what causes the object on our circular path to accelerate toward the center of that path. So we know that Newton's second law states that force is equal to mass times acceleration. And we've already seen uh, what centripetal acceleration looks like. So uh, we can put that together then, and we get force is equal to uh, mass times velocity squared divided by radius. Okay. Uh, this is very, very important for centripetal force, and this is in your data booklet as well. Um, what is awesome about this is we can equate lots of other forces to centripetal force here. So we could throw in friction or tension or gravitational or electromagnetic forces and equate them to this part of the equation. So very, very convenient. So here's one example. We've got a vehicle on a circular path accelerating toward the center of that path due to frictional force acting on the tires. In other words, our car is going around a curve. Okay, so our frictional force then is going to be equal to the friction coefficient times mass times gravitational acceleration. We know this from topic two. And now we can conveniently equate our forces like this. And uh, this is absolutely a fundamental skill in physics you should hopefully be used to it already by topic six, but you're definitely going to be using it more and more as we add more topics. Now you'll note if we know um, any number of these variables, we can solve for the other ones. Uh, you might also note that mass is going to cancel out of this particular equation, which uh, is always fun. Okay, uh, so what we have established so far is that uh, we have this lengthy equation with all these different terms. Any of these terms can be equated to other forces, tension, friction, gravitational, acceleration, uh, sorry, electrical or magnetic forces. Okay, any one of those terms. All right, so we're going to look at one more example here before we wrap things up, and we're going to look at a pendulum. In topic four, we learned that pendulums oscillate in two dimensions, and that's how we approached it, or topic nine as well. Um, in reality, pendulums oscillate in three dimensions, and the path will be circular-ish. Uh, it's rarely a perfect circle, but we're going to assume that our pendulum is oscillating on a perfectly circular path for topic six, okay? So here's our free body diagram, um, and it's really important that you only show these two forces when you're doing a free body diagram of a pendulum. Uh, a lot of students have a tendency to draw a centripetal force. Additionally, do not do that. Okay, you only need to show these two forces. If you add centripetal force, you're doubling the uh, horizontal component of tension here. Don't do that. Okay, only two forces need to be shown, tension and weight for a free body diagram. Uh, missed some animation. It's okay. Things were going so well up until now. Okay, anyway, moving on. Uh, so this diagram shows the components of tension, and this is what students sometimes try to put onto this diagram. If you put everything on there, it, it's okay, but you don't need to. You can just show these two, these two forces, and you're fine. Um, but when you get into the deeper analysis, yeah, we need to consider the components of tension. So we do that here. Okay, so we've got our components of tension, and they are uh, negative W, and that is going to be negative weight, uh, and that'll be the vertical component of tension. 
and our weight vectors are going to cancel out here. In other words, the length of this force arrow is gonna be exactly the same length as this force arrow, and they're in the opposite directions, so they go bye-bye. Okay, so what remains then is our horizontal component of tension, our centripetal force, and this is the net force acting on the system. Okay, uh, so using trigonometry, we will find that centripetal force is equal to negative mass times gravitational acceleration times tangent of theta, and we can then equate that to uh, our centripetal force. So this is a component of tension, and this is the equation for centripetal force we gave previously. Uh, I have a video that I'm going to put up in the corner here, and it will give a detailed breakdown of the trigonometry, but I wanna keep this particular video kind of short, so we're gonna stop here. Okay, so my sources for this video are of course, Physics for the IB Diploma by our buddy K.A. Sokos. Uh, and I prepared this presentation using GeoGebra, Google Slides Concepts, Illustrator, Vectornator, Latex, et cetera, et cetera, probably some other stuff too. Remember, do not click like, do not subscribe, unless you really have to, in which case it's fine. Don't worry about it. Okay, have a great day.